one of my most requested topics is making a video on the Germanic substrate theory. There are many common claims about the pre-Indo-European substrate in Germanic found, particularly online and in literature. These include upwards to 30% of the Germanic lexicon is non-Indo-European, Germanic is the most unusual Indo-European language family, Germanic speakers have non-Indo-European genetics, like the I1 haplogroup, Germanic sound changes like Grimm's Lua were directly caused by second language speakers, Proto-Germanic was a simplified Creole language. Uralic languages were spoken in the Germanic speech area before Indo-European. In this video I will go through all these claims and show that most of these are simply wrong or exaggerated. The number of 30% is based on an estimate made by over a century ago by Sigmund Feist. In turn based on an estimate made by Bruno Lieblich of Germanic words that are based on etymologizability meaning words not found outside of Germanic, and not by actually using signs of obvious non-Indo-European phonotactics. The methodology is flawed and most of the hard words like hand and king have gotten sound etymologies based on derivation through ablaut, accent, compounding and so on over the decades of Indo-European research since then. The latest research, such as that conducted by Schuss Kronen, has drastically reduced the non-Indo-European part to a bare 4 to 5 percent of the Germanic vocabulary, and many words are shared pre Indo European agriculture and nature words with other branches like Italic or Slavic. The word king has been often included on lists as a difficult substrate word, but native speakers of medieval Germanic languages were keenly aware that it was a compound of two separate words. For example, in Old English, the word kune was actually used in compounds forming something meaning royal or kingly. Also, the word konr in Old Norse simply mean male relative or son. Some Old Norse texts actually make the connection between kun and konungr, meaning that the native speakers of early mid-Germanic knew it was a word composed of that element. Another typical word included on substrate lists is the word hand, but in fact it's more a straightforward derivative of a root already used for many other words in Germanic, simply being an O grade of a word usually found in zero grade and used for words meaning to capture, to hunt or to reach in Germanic. It has a very simple Indo-European etymology using regular sound laws. In fact, Germanic scores very high in the contribution of cognates reconstructed the Proto-Indo-European, which goes straight against the idea of a big substrate in Germanic. Another typical claim you find sometimes is the idea that Germanic is the most unusual of the Indo-European language family. This is simply because Germanic is attested much later than for example Indo-Aryan or Greek, meaning that comparing it to ancient Greek or Sanskrit from over a millennium earlier is bound to be unfair and give a warped image where Germanic seems much more changed. Most of the major changes like loss of noun case and much of the verbal morphology in the modern languages like English and Swedish are recent and don't represent the earlier stages of the language, or more conservative varieties like Icelandic that still have many old Indo-European traits. So just looking at modern languages gives a very warped image. For example, you wouldn't compare Hindi with Old Norse. The phonetic trajectory from Proto-Indo-European to Proto-Germanic is also pretty clear-cut, and not much more drastic than for example a language like Proto-Slavic. The major difference in Germanic compared to other branches is in the structure of the verbal system. Another typical statement that shows up in claims about the substrate theory is that Germanic speakers are not Indo-European genetically speaking, usually including claims about the I1 haplogroup. However, recent research shows that Germanic speaking groups don't really have a strong continuity with older Stone Age cultures, such as the Neolithic megalithic cultures, but are mostly the descendants of the Corded Ware or Battle Axe culture to this day. The Indo-European settlers drastically changed the landscape through slash and burn agriculture and cattle herding around 2000 BC. There is very little continuity between, for example, pitted ware culture and later historical Germanic groups, maybe apart from a suggested substrate word like seal. The widespread hybrid group I1 is likely the result of a Bronze Age founder effect in an already Indo-European speaking cultural context where Neolithic farmer groups were assimilated. In fact, there might have been as suggested in a recent paper, several Indo-European migrations into Scandinavia, with Germanic coming with a second wave from the east. 
The settlement of Indo-Europeans in southern Scandinavia has been compared to the European settlement of North America by Professor Christian Christiansen. One central part of the Germanic substrate theory is the idea that Germanic sound shifts were caused by second language learners mispronouncing Proto-Indo-European. While Grimm's law might seem like a drastic shift, similar shifts have also happened in other Indo-European branches, with for example Greek turning p t k into f s h and b d g into v z g, very similar to Germanic. Armenian also shows similar shifts with for example devoicing. And Germanic itself underwent a second High German consonant shift in southern Germany. It's also very likely that Grimm's and Werner's laws operated in distinct stages over a long period of time, over several generations, meaning that if you had it attested, it wouldn't seem as drastic. The shift of root accent in Germanic is also far from unique. Many Indo European languages have also undergone that shift largely independently. Old Italic languages like Old Latin, Celtic, and also Latvian and Czech have shifted to a root initial accent, largely independently on one another. The Germanic sound shifts are also way too late, around the Iron Age, to be attributed to substrate influence. Also, the clear distinction between the original Indo-European stop series was maintained throughout the shift without mergers, unlike what second language speakers probably would do if they were unfamiliar with Proto-Indo-European pronunciation, resulting in mergers. Another part of the Germanic substrate theory is the idea that Germanic was unusually simplified compared to other Indo-European branches. But actually, Proto-Germanic was a highly inflected ancient Indo-European language. It's highly likely that the real historical Proto-Germanic was likely even more inflected than the usual Proto-Germanic reconstruction, with, for example, clear traces of locative and ablative. Proto-Germanic kept many archaic leftovers from Proto-Indo-European, like, for example, a productive ablaut system, to derive nouns from verbs and so on, along with the strong verb system, and minor noun classes like root nouns. Germanic even expanded on the Indo-European morphology by creating weak and strong adjectives and expanding the n-stem declension with feminines. The only major simplifications in Germanic are the leveling of verb tense and loss of dual in nouns. The idea that Germanic was a trade language is hard to reconcile with the structure of the language, since it seems to be a language that developed for a very long time in a small, tightly knit speech community, and there is a clear bottleneck from Proto-Indo-European with sound changes and gram grammar changes not shared with other Indo-European branches. Proto-Germanic also kept the original Indo-European accent throughout most of its development, and many sound changes in Germanic are completely dependent on the original Indo-European accent placement. As said earlier, comparing Germanic to, for example, Vedic Sanskrit or Ancient Greek is highly anachronistic, since they are separated by over a millennium. However, it's more justified to compare Germanic languages like Gothic to Vulgar Latin, which at the time was already losing its case system, whereas all Germanic languages kept a full 4K system long into the medieval period, or even till today. All the Germanic languages also had a complex system of interaction between case forms in relation to verbs and prepositions, best preserved in modern Icelandic, with for example the quirky subject, something we wouldn't expect in a language spoken as a simplified trade pigeon. Also, Hittite, the oldest attested in European language, lacks many of the verb forms found in languages like Latin and Greek, such as for example the future tense, and some scholars suggest that some of the verb forms reconstructed for Proto-Indo-European, maybe didn't even exist in Proto-Germanic to begin with. A very persistent idea is the idea that Uralic languages like Finnic or Sami were spoken in the Germanic speech area before Indo-European speakers arrived. And this idea is often combined with the idea that acted as a substrate to Proto-Germanic. However, there are many problems with this statement. And it's probably a widespread notion since Uralic is non-Indo-European and thus easily thought of as pre-Indo-European. Coastal Finland and Estonia were a part of the Corded Ware Horizon, which is identified with Indo-European languages, and Uralic is generally dated to have arrived and settled in the Bronze and Iron Ages, with Sami not reaching northern Scandinavia until a few centuries AD, assimilating pre-Uralic groups in the process and being in contact with Proto-Norse at the same time. Southern Scandinavia also lacks any known pre-Indo-European place names, 
Even archaic pre-Germanic word forms show a clear continuity of place names into the attested Old Norse period. So sum things up, the otherness of Germanic is greatly exaggerated, and Germanic was likely, at least for a time, even somewhat conservative in particular in phonology. Germanic does have a small substrate layer, but many of those words are shared with other European branches, pointing to a Neolithic pre-Indo-European language family. The substrate is mostly identified with the Neolithic farmers and consists of words for crops, husbandry and local wildlife, like names for birds and fish. Germanic-speaking groups have mostly steppe ancestry, like most Northern Europeans. And most importantly, Northern Europe became settled by Indo-European speakers very early, and traces of pre-Indo-European groups in areas like for example Denmark are practically lost to the depth of time.